Um, the thing I want to talk about tonight is uh, it's a question I get from a lot of my students. So I, I teach a blockchain development um, uh, program at, at George Brown College. We cover um, a variety of things. We, we go deeply into uh, Solidity programming in Ethereum, and we do hyperledger fabric and uh, full stack development. Um, at some point, the students realize that all the software is open source and decentralization means nobody owns anything. And it's a very new industry. There's not a lot of companies. And the big question comes up, how do I make any money out of this? How do I get a career out of this? So that's what I'm going to try to address uh, today. So maybe you're thinking of getting into the blockchain world and um, that's, you know, you got to pay your rent and stuff and, and feed yourself. So that, that's a good question. So I'm going to talk about a bit about me. Why is this even a question? Um, uh, a little briefing, what we can do. I'm going to take a look at a variety of business models. And then I'm going to take a look at what's hot in the industry right now and what may be hot in the future. So uh, me, I'm a, I'm a fractional CTO. So I provide CTO services for a variety of startups. Um, New Binary is actually a, an agency that they um, they provide me out to uh, startups as a C to fractional CTO. Um, Relic Health is a, um, it's a remote patient monitoring uh, operation. And um, Artcryption is an NFT platform. I'm also an um, identity architect at Northern Block. Northern Block is a blockchain company, and they specialize a lot in self-sovereign identity, and I architect uh, systems for them. I'm, I'm actually working on the Ontario ID project right now, which is um, a really interesting uh, uh, advancement in that field. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Credential Network. Um, so this is a uh, self-sovereign identity network that'll be for the private sector in Canada. Uh, I'm a partial load professor at George Brown College for their blockchain development program. I'm the co-chair of the Innovation Experts Committee of the um, Digital Identity and Authentication Council of Canada. And I'm the blockchain technical lead at the Ryerson Cybersecurity Research Lab. Um, and I do it all from this darkened lab I've got in the background here. So I've been in the, in the software industry for over 35 years now and the last four years in blockchain. So, um, I was getting bored with uh, mobile and web development and I wanted to try something different. And I always like to be sort of on the, the leading edge of things and blockchain came around. It's like, I want to be a blockchain guy. And uh, I had to go through the same thing that uh, my uh, students are starting to realize is how do you become a blockchain person? Um, how do you make money? How do you get, how do you get work in this? Um, and the reason why we're even asking this question is um, blockchain gets, gets rid of a lot of, Gatekeeping. So decentralized systems means you don't have a central person holding information or holding resources um, away from from other people. So a lot of that sort of gatekeeping activity is the, is the way that people um, create uh, value. And so when we get rid of those middle people, we get rid of that way of making money. And so uh, we're we're erasing business models at that point. And so if you have a decentralized system, no one owns it. No one owns the Ethereum blockchain. It's it's a it's this weird concept that it's it's used by millions of people. Nobody owns it. It's just this thing that's out there. Um, and if you're in a business where you're doing some sort of billing for access of this decentralized system, um, then you're not actually providing a decentralized system. And we'll talk about how you don't have to have a decentralized system to make money with blockchain. So what what um, should your revenue models be based on? So it's providing services in the software industry back in the, the good old days when I started, um, we would write some software, we would uh, duplicate up floppy disks, print up some boxes and manuals and ship this off to stores and sell it to people. And so as many as we could um, uh, duplicate up and sell, we, we could use that to churn out money. So it was a very high margin business and um, uh, you know, and you could come up with new releases every year and uh, go back to your, your clientele and uh, extract more money out of them. So that was a great model. And what happened was companies end up being valued multiple times their revenue. So you'd see these, you know, 40 times the, the revenue figure for the valuation of a company. That's a software product company that, that doesn't exist in the blockchain world. So you actually have to provide services. And services uh, companies are, are valued in sort of a, a declining um, uh, 
rate from what your current revenue model is. So, so if this year's revenue, you may be like 50% of it next year, you know, um, 10% the year after that, 5% the year after that, that becomes the value of your company if you go to sell it. So um, it's not the same as the, as the good old days um, uh, because decentralization has killed a lot of that. So you need to add some value to a decentralized system. You can't, uh, there are ways of getting passive income, but a, a good guaranteed way of having a, um, uh, some sort of business value proposition is to add value to what's going on with the system. And the big thing here is you can't stop competitors. So for a lot of work in decentralized systems, anyone can do what you're doing. So if, if you've got some smart contracts that run what you have, then you've got to make those smart contracts transparent to people, which means you probably put them on GitHub, which means anyone can take those smart contracts, look at what you've done and reproduce what you've done. You can't stop that. So let's take a look at um, uh, a variety of the sort of business models that you can use to either um, go work at a company that does that sort of thing, start your own company or provide services to that. So a really obvious one is operations. So if somebody, uh, if, if there are companies who are trying to uh, access blockchain systems or host blockchain systems, you can provide those services. Uh, a good one, well, a couple of obvious ones are AWS, uh, Google Cloud Platform, Azure, um, uh, IBM Cloud. There are some smaller players in the, uh, the cloud business. Um, let's say you're trying to do uh, something yourself. Um, maybe you could set up a very specialized service. Um, things that come to mind are the, the guys who set up Pinata. So they take an IPFS and they said, hey, we'll provide a pinning service where you can, you can uh, pay us money to do that. That's a clever one. Um, uh, another good one is Infura. Infura says, hey, if you don't want to run your own uh, Ethereum node, we'll run a node for you. Matter of fact, we'll run a whole bunch of nodes and we'll provide a bunch of extra services on top of that. And you can pay us for that. And that may actually be cheaper and more efficient than uh, running your own uh, nodes. Um, integration. This is a big one. I, I always like this. I like to participate in integration projects because uh, I'm, I'm a consultant and I charge money for my time and integration always needs that. So anytime, if you do have a decentralized system, people who wish to participate in that have to integrate that to their existing legacy systems. Okay. Um, you, they're, there, sure, there, there will be companies that will be completely virtual and in the, the blockchain, but um, that's going to be limited to sort of DAO type operations. So um, if let's say, um, you know, Starbucks or Canadian Tire or, or some, some sort of company like that wishes to um, use a decentralized system, maybe they're doing it for supply chain or purchasing or um, loyalty points, something like that, they're going to have to connect it up to their... Um, existing legacy systems. Someone has to help them do that. Okay, so there's software services, there's uh, developing the, the connection pieces, maybe you have a set of libraries that helps them out. Um, customization, uh, so maybe they need their own smart contracts to, to take a place in this, um, to provide a better user interface. So maybe you're providing them or their customers a web interface or a mobile interface. Um, and, and maybe it's taking uh, something that is a open source piece and uh, adding a whole branding experience on top of it. So let's say, um, uh, well, let's say Starbucks decide they want to have their own crypto wallet. So sure, take a, an open source uh, project, slap the, um, the, the Starbucks logo on top of it, and that's some work that you can actually charge money for. Consulting, another place I like to make money on with this. So decentralized systems are new. Blockchain systems are new. This is a whole new thing. People don't understand this yet. And because they don't understand this yet, they're going to have to pay someone who understands it. How do you get paid to understand this? Be a couple of months ahead of the people who are paying you <laughs> on the knowledge that's required. So if you're good at learning things fast, if you're good at explaining things, this is a great opportunity to, to make some money. So um, organizations that are looking to join a system may require the services of a consultant to help them make the right decisions. So yeah, if, if a company is, is deciding on how they're going to move forward, they, they need help. Um, they, they want to talk to someone who has experience doing this or has a specialized knowledge that they don't have. They could go off and take several months to gain that knowledge, 
But if you've spent several months gaining that knowledge, you now have value that you can provide. Um, you can create reports that you, you can sell off to people. Um, you can become a, a recommender. Uh, you can mentor uh, other people. You can help uh, create project plans or architectures. You can help create governance systems. Decentralized um, uh, systems need governance. So uh, uh, the guy who was just talking about the Maple system was talking about that at the very end. They want to have a governance token so that people can come back and um, provide them feedback uh, on what they should do and vote on that. And so that's a whole governance system. And so if you become an expert on decentralized governance, there's a huge opportunity for that in consulting. Education, another place where I make money here. Um, so again, decentralized systems are new. And so uh, companies who want to get involved in a decentralized system or, or blockchain or crypto, they're going to require education. There's a lot of education involved with that. Uh, with crypto, there's uh, how do you handle this from an accounting perspective, um, uh, taxation, um, uh, what do you need in security around this? So there's a lot of different questions that people are going to have, and they're going to need to be educated to make the, um, if not make the correct decisions, then to understand um, uh, the person who's making the decisions for them. Um, it's it's good to be able to provide people backgrounds in the theory of all this. Um, quite often, you get a lot of questions on uh, sort of cryptographic primitives used in blockchain. So that's something to go in and, and learn about. Uh, actually, uh, Vitaly has a really good blog on cryptography that uh, is very accessible, and I'd recommend that. You can train software developers. So uh, this is what I do quite often is uh, if I'm working on a project and they bring in software developers, it's easier to take software developers who have a domain knowledge uh, in a certain subject matter and teach them blockchain than it is to uh, take a blockchain person and teach them, let's say, healthcare, software development, or a lot of heavy financial stuff. So in that case, there's there's training that can be provided. Um, uh, I never thought I'd ever become a professor, but here I am. I'm a professor at George Brown College. Um, and then um, there's other things you can educate people on. Again, governance. This is a, a big piece that's coming up. And people don't really understand governance. Governance has been a very um, uh, sort of a policy wonk thing that uh, lawyers would know, like um, uh, articles of incorporation and corporate bylaws. So that sort of thing, but but taken and put onto a blockchain or put into an application um, and used in a decentralized manner is a whole new area. And it's a, it's a green field for, for getting involved in. Um, Analysis. So the thing is, decentralized systems are very transparent. So you can, um, if you create your own node for Ethereum, you can go in there and you can walk through every single block in the blockchain and see every single transaction. There's nothing to stop you from taking that, putting that into a um, uh, relational database and start doing some processing on that. And the next thing you know, you're you're able to uh, spot trends. You're able to uh, show some charts and things. You can do analysis for people. So if someone wants to have an idea of what's going on currently in the marketplace or what past trends have been, you can actually go off and process that data. And that's that's something that's valuable you can provide. And the 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 barrier to entry is is pretty low. All that data is transparent right there. So. Um, this is a big thing is is that's all data but if if you are able to um, process that you can turn it into information so data doesn't have a lot of value information does so you know a list of um, every single movie ever made um, is not that uh, interesting but if uh, let's say you take um, uh, what's the the tomatoes uh website so they actually have they've gone to all the different critics and they've gathered that information of uh what do people think rotten tomatoes yes thank you <laughs> what do people think what do the critics think of those movies and all of a sudden they've turned that data into information and now they have value you can do the same thing with blockchain so let's say you took all of the um the nft sales for the last two years um and you start to look at those and you look at the trends of those you may actually be able to extract information from that raw data and someone would pay you for that. So identifying trends, uh, suggesting optimizations. Uh, this is another interesting one. If 
There are companies that have smart contracts that are poorly done. Uh, every single time they're executing that smart contract, they may be wasting money on the um, solidity um, uh, operations that are happening. So you can actually come into them and say, hey, I can save you uh, $200,000 a year in three lines of code. Are you interested? Um, that's a pretty good pitch. Um, and you can provide market data. So um, there, there are lots of different people who are interested in market data. Um, if you have an interesting spin on how you can uh, put together uh, statistics and things, uh, think of like in baseball. In baseball, they have all of these wild statistics and, and other sports are starting to pick up on this now. And they make decisions on these. So you can um, start creating your own types of stats and people will come to you to get those because uh, you have them, you understand it, and you, you have a way of putting it together very quickly. Um, aggregation. So um, decentralized systems have very decentralized users. So people are all over the place. If you have a way of gathering uh, data from multiple sources or putting people together, uh, you uh, have a way of making money. So if you can uh, put together things like, um, uh, here's an example. So uh, car accident uh, information plus insurance and vehicle type information. If you're able to put all this together, you can extract some um, uh, value out of this by, by creating some specialized information. So uh, let's say, let's go back to the, the NFTs again. If you can see who's, who's buying the, the certain NFTs and at what time of day, um, and then you're comparing that against, uh, you know, uh, decentralized exchanges to find out how the money is being moved around. Maybe there's a, an interesting play that can happen there. Um, discovery. This is an interesting one. This is how people find things. So right now, you know, stuff is all throughout the, the blockchain as transactions in blocks. Um, there's some simple tools like Etherscan you could use on the Ethereum blockchain to, to go out and find things, but it's, it's not really helping you discover what you want. Um, so platforms like this, uh, let's say OpenSea, OpenSea in the NFT space is um, a good one for this. It helps you discover the NFTs that you can buy. So they actually give you a visual representation um, and they'll have curated experiences. You go to their homepage and they and they present it up to say, these are the ones that you should be interested in. So by providing discovery, you're you're providing a filter. You're you're like a, a, a curator. You're a um, like radio stations uh, used to do this. You know, the thousands of new releases would come out each year. The radio stations would say, oh, well, we're um, we're a classic rock station. So we're going to pick these artists and these songs, and we're going to play these over and over and over to death. Um, but that's that's a way that they made money. And now you can see this um, Spotify. You have different uh, tastemakers who make their lists and things on there. So they're they're actually providing discovery. So instead of you having to go listen to all the music um, throughout the whole system, you can go to these lists and find music that matches your set of interests. Um, because finding things is difficult. Uh, and a good way to do this is, um, this is the piece I was talking about earlier, just um, take the blockchain blocks and those transactions, throw it into a relational database and start searching through things. And all of a sudden you have a lot of information. So this is a, this is a, a cool trick that can underlie a lot of different uh, business opportunities. So if you're looking for a way to, to get into blockchain, start thinking about that is if I had a copy of all the blocks in a relational database, not in a blockchain, how can I process that in a way that blockchain can't to extract information out? Uh, curation is kind of what I was just talking about there. Um, curator, you're going to search for the best or most relevant data based on a set of criteria. Um, organizations will pay for the work of curation. Um, and the other thing is content creators could offer you commissions. So let's say um, you have a, you know, the, the most um, impressive uh, NFTs released uh, list. So maybe you have a top 40 list of NFTs. Um, to get on that list, the uh, content creators may have to give you a kickback. They're saying, great, we'd like to get on your list because you have a million subscribers looking at your list and you're generating a lot of sales in the NFT marketplace we'll give you a 5% commission um, to be on your list. Or maybe to be on my list, you need 5% commission. So uh, curation can, can pay. Uh, auditing services. 
This is a really important one. Uh, whenever corporations are getting involved in uh, blockchain, uh, particularly if they're using this as a, a payment rail, they are going to need auditing services. Their traditional auditors don't really have the tools to do this. Um, I th some of them are just starting to, to get into this space right now, and they're gonna have to get in there very quickly. And that's, that's going to be just for like large companies, and not just for financial transactions, but um, other types of transactions that take place too. So if there's a supply chain and this is used for inventory, if it's used for uh, shipping, insurance, things like that, um, they're gonna need uh, auditing that goes on. So again, um, you can create reports on this, you can do analysis for fraud, um, you can um, look for uh, problems, you can actually do proactive monitoring this is a, a, a really important thing in the auditing world. Auditing tends to take place well after the fact. So a company uh, engages in another company in a transaction, they do the transaction, the transaction gets recorded in the accounting system. A few months later, the auditors come along, they take a look at the accounting system, they match that back to the original documents, and then they, they go through some things. And so it could be six months to a year after a fraudulent transaction has happened that the auditors discover it. So you get this, this long delay. Whereas if you said, hey, I can provide you real-time auditing. So all your auditing reports, your fraud analysis and everything like that can happen um, seconds after your transaction goes through. That's a, that's a really um, compelling service to be able to, to provide. Um, maintenance. Hey, uh, these decentralized systems, um, they need to change. Uh, um, what happens is uh, uh, you know, smart contracts eventually have to be updated. Um, uh, code in the back end has to be changed. Um, in some cases, you can do the work directly for a company. In some cases, a uh, governance organization will be put in place. And uh, when people vote on, their, on what to do, part of that is, hey, we need a new smart contract that does split payments, let's say. So we, we now will contract out to someone to do that and they'll They'll put out an RFP, people respond, the governance organization will vote on who gets that deal, and then uh, the money goes out. So if you're a maintenance organization um, doing sort of custom software, you, you have a world where you can operate in uh, with, with blockchain. Um, providing access. So um, uh, people uh, or organizations need to be able to um, get onboarded with this. And there's, there's a variety of different ways they can do this. So part of it was the integration I was talking about before. Some of it's consulting, some of it's um, uh, uh, education. Um, some of it are things like uh, when I was talking about Infura, um, providing services to people. Um, maybe it's running nodes for people, um, uh, simplifying the, uh, the user interface for people. Um, uh, sorry, uh, the, the bridging between different systems. It may even be, be bridging between blockchain systems. An interesting one like this is the, um, uh, what's the protocol? There's, there's a payment protocol um, that allows you to go from one uh, type of crypto to another to another, and you can basically match up between uh, any type of thing, and it's just using escrows in between each one, which is something that, that blockchain systems are, are really good at. Uh, data vaults. I, I thought this was a, um, a weird one. I, I worked with um, uh, a company, and we, we shared office space uh, with a, a mining company. Uh, uh, they were Bitcoin and Ethereum mining company. And one day, uh, the guy said, Data, I need your help. I'm, I'm transferring a million dollars in, in Bitcoin, and I want to make sure I don't screw this up. And I'm like, oh, who are you transferring to? He goes, I'm putting it into a data vault. I'm like, why would you do that? <laughs> That, that makes no sense whatsoever. Your, your security is your, your key. You, you shouldn't put it into a system like that. But um, the data vault themselves provided insurance on it. And this was something that the investors in his company said, we want, because we think uh, this money could disappear really fast. You know, if you get bored of your work and all of a sudden all of the crypto that's that's been uh, created from the mining operation disappears with you, we're not very happy with that. So a, a data vault is a way of, um, uh, usually it's done with a multiple key signature. So the maybe uh, some of the board members um, and maybe the, um, the operating team, the management team of the company 
will have to sign it as well as people from the data vault company. So you have these multiple level signatures so that this money is locked up for a period of time, the crypto is locked up, and then it can come out another period of time. And this, this um, doesn't have to be just private keys. It can be, th be things like verifiable credentials. Maybe you have a verifiable credential, which is part of a, an SSI thing. Maybe it says, hey, I, I own this business or I own this um, property. Um, uh, it could be signed documents. There's a lot of things you can provide in a, a, a data vault for people. Um, brokering. People need to be able to get together. Um, so if you have someone who would like to borrow money and you'd have someone like to loan out money, just like the, the Maple guy was talking about, they're providing a, a brokering system. So they're they're putting this pool together and they're providing liquidity um, by bringing the two the two parties together. Uh, you could build this through a, a reputation like a, a KYC type thing. Um, there may be um, escrows involved or, or you can actually um, set up an escrow service. This is a, a really easy, simple thing to do. You're, you're competing against lawyers who have very slow systems and they charge a lot of money. So uh, a really simple business model, set up an escrow. Um, what's hot right now? So um, it was interesting that, that the Maple uh, guy was talking just before me because a lot of people, um, they've got crypto and they're just sitting on it. So cryptocurrency was not meant as a, um, it was not meant as a security. It was not meant as a, an investment vehicle. It was meant as a, as a payment um, uh, method. So it holds value, but it's used to transfer value. That's why all of the, if you, if you get into solidity developing in um, Ethereum, you'll see that pretty much everything is about how you transfer and how you put restrictions on transferring. Um, and so, but people are sitting on this stuff and sure it's, it fluctuates and you can make money. Um, and over time you should make a little bit of money, but you should probably be uh, more intelligent with it and actually have your money working for you in, in an active way than just sort of passively hoping that the, the cryptocurrency value goes up. So uh, DeFi is great that way. So DeFi can, can tap into these holdings and get that money out there and doing some work. Um, Self-sovereign identity. This is this is the, the dark horse that in the last uh, six months or so, um, and you'll see this in the next two years, this has become really big. So this is using verifiable credentials um, so that an individual can hold their own um, uh, identity and information. So basically it's just um, organizations sign stuff and give it to a person. So if I have a driver's license as a verifiable credential, um, I'm in, in on Toronto, Ontario. So the province of Ontario, the Ministry of Transportation, um, they actually sign the, um, uh, the, the credential that says Dave McKay has an Ontario driver's license. And then I have that and I can prove that. So if I go to rent a car, if I go to somewhere where I need to show ID, I can show that as, as ID. And they can verify that, that that was actually issued by the government to me and it hasn't been revoked. Um, this is really big because all the provincial governments in Canada are, are standing up systems right now. I'm, I'm actually working on building that. Once that's in place, the private sector will be able to use these. So instead of having to go into your bank in person to open up a bank account or get a loan, you'll actually be able to um, do this online because there is a um, high assurance level of your identity information that's actually higher than you know showing a plastic card to someone. Um, and it's all machine readable as well. So that's a really powerful one. NFTs, uh, a year ago, this, these just blew right up. It, um, people had sort of ignored NFTs for a long time. There was, there was the initial rush with CryptoKitties. And then all of a sudden, um, the artists got involved and started releasing on the platform. And NFTs are just huge right now and will continue to, to go on because of the, um, the, the proof of ownership, the provenance, which shows the chain of ownership and the whole fact that you can digitally twin things. So right now it's artworks, but it's going to be, um, well, there are experiential things. Like if you liked the halftime show of the Super Bowl, you know, you can, you can own that now as an NFT. So it's a ridiculous concept. Um, but it's, it's opening up a whole new marketplace of uh, sort of collectibles. Um, decentralized exchanges um, are, are really hot right now. Everyone's moving towards those because it cuts out a lot of the 
shenanigans. The, in the early days, the exchanges, if someone wanted to get their token listed, they had to give a whole bunch of those tokens to the exchange to, to actually get on there. So, and they were sort of forced to do that because they need to be on the exchange to provide liquidity to get people to buy their tokens. And the people who started these exchanges um, made insane amounts of money. Um, and I don't think they should have. So I prefer decentralized exchanges. And decentralized exchanges um, now offer up this way of doing arbitrage. So if you see, you know, um, the price difference between Bitcoin and ETH on exchange, one exchange that's different from another, you can actually buy and sell across these and turn a profit. And a matter of fact, you can do that by borrowing someone else's money to do that. You can say, hey, I spotted an opportunity. And if in the next 10 seconds we execute on this, um, if you lend me your, your 10,000 ETH, I will turn that into, um, you know, 10,050 ETH. And, uh, you know, that kind of uh, instant profit is, is a, a very profitable thing. <laughs> very, very. Um, now, the nice thing about this is once people start um, uh, doing all this arbitrage, it's going to like sort of shrink it down, which actually helps in stabilizing the currency. So we're going to see with a lot of this sort of activity that happens, um, where people are optimizing uh, trades and things, we, we should see a, a reduction in some of the um, uh, volatility that we're seeing in, in cryptocurrencies right now. And finally, what what may be some things that um, uh, show up as as interesting things in the future? So. There's a lot of activity in the public uh, blockchains, but there's also the permissioned blockchain. So supply chain um, is about to make a, a huge boom. Um, uh, the ICO marketplace kind of died out because, frankly, those were um, uh, a lot of the uh, financially um, secure countries uh, made those things illegal. But security tokens actually follow laws allowed by the um, uh, the SEC in the United States. So that uh, all they need to do is find a way of making their markets um, uh, talk to each other. And I think the self-sovereign identity is a solution for that. Personal health records. So this is the healthcare marketplace um, using uh, blockchain and verifiable credentials. This is one that that for a long time that we, we thought would hit it. So green energy and carbon capture. Um, there's a lot of incentive to be able to track this stuff. And I, I think there's some movement in here that this, this may break out in the next year or two. Um, international trade and payments. So um, right now, international trade is, is kind of a scary thing. You're, you send money off to a company in a faraway place and they ship you goods, you, you hope. And then when you get those goods, you, you, you hope they're in good shape. So right now, there's a bunch of uh, middlemen that will do things around this to try to... Um, uh, relieve some of that um, uh, risk involved. And so for risk mitigation, um, smart contracts and blockchain is a, a really great way to do that. And another is um, decentralized marketplaces. I, I think the same way that we saw the NFT marketplace take off, we're going to see um, regular products. So if you go to, let's say, Amazon right now, Amazon is kind of this decentralized marketplace. Um, when you buy some goods on Amazon, it's not sold to you by Amazon. It's, it's sold through their platform, but it's sold to you by someone else and they ship it through uh, Amazon's system. So why will they need to use Amazon in the future if they can put all of their stuff in a um, some sort of uh, token uh, in a blockchain? So if that represents, hey, I'm selling these, these bolts in packs of 10 and someone else sells them in packs of 20 and someone else sells a slightly longer bolt in a pack of 10, or they sell the same bolt but made of a different material. All of those will be in a decentralized marketplace, and then you can have uh, people come in and curating those. Like I'm, I'm bolts are us. I only, I only provide the bolts on a blockchain. Where someone else may say, yeah, I'm, I'm selling um, uh, furniture for your bathroom. Uh, so there's a lot of possibilities where that's going to go. Okay, and that's um, basically. What I wanted to cover is, uh, you know, what revenue models I think are going to work in a decentralized world, what's currently working and what may work in the future, and how you can either go find companies like this and get them on board with it, start your own company, um, or go work for someone who's doing this. All right, Adam, we got some questions? 
Yes, we do, Dave. Uh, thank you so much. Um, that was amazing. Super. It just kind of covered a, a few different things. I think we've had some really interesting conversations tonight about a few different things. So I think that was a really nice way to kind of put a little crypto bow on it all. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, let's jump into a couple of questions. We've got a question from Owens. Owens has asked, uh, this is really good content. Will these slides be available anywhere or can they be made available after the presentation? Yes. Yeah, so, Owen, um, I've mentioned at the start of the chat that these are all going to be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, if you scroll up, I'll, uh, I'll just put that in the chat section here for you, mate. So, yeah. Uh, Yes, yeah, so they will, they'll be a, a, give us about 10 days, uh, 10 business days, and then they should be up. Um, so we have another question from Owens. Uh, Owens asks, do you think providing decentralized database management system for software developers is a viable avenue as well? I say this because interacting with blockchain can be a bit slow for common. Yeah, actually, cases. this is, um, this is a really good one. Um, Right now, all we have for decentralized um, storage is IPFS. And IPFS, it's it's just basically a hash. Um, and it doesn't really allow you to um, have a lot of sophisticated things. You can't index stuff. You can't search. You can't, uh, there's no CRUD operations on it. Um, and so we're actually seeing quite a few plays right now of companies that are creating uh, decentralized uh, database systems. And the types of data you'll you'll see there because a lot of companies um, need to run uh, transparent things let's say uh, for example blockchain so the blockchain um, you could use something like ipfs for something very simple let's say you had um, i did some work for uh, the cannabis industry so whenever um, they harvest cannabis or it goes through a step of processing it has to go to a testing facility and the testing facility comes back with a document of authentication saying here is the list of all the cannabinoids in it and what percentages they have. And that's something that goes into IPFS. But um, what it doesn't have is later on, a, a product may have a provenance of a variety of different things. So it, it may be an ointment that's made with, um, uh, uh, not the THC, but the, uh, whatever the other active ingredient is. Um, CBD. So, CBD, yeah. So it might be CBD, but also you have um, these different uh, components of the ointment. So what's in there? People might want to be worried about sort of um, allergies that come from that. And what's the provenance of those things? So a lot of that information that, that gets built up over time as something goes through a supply chain, that needs to be stored somewhere. And I, and I think a decentralized database and decentralized storage that way is, is a very valuable thing. Um, uh, it's, it's going to take, we're a couple of years away from having a good understanding of this and having a lot of use cases that'll use it. But I think if you get into it now, it'll pay off in three to four years, big time. 